Today is day three for the Come Follow Me readings for this week, April 17th to the 23rd. Matthew 18 and Luke 10. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Wednesday, April 19th, 2023. Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Forgiveness. Effective leaders forgive others. Guide to the scriptures for forgive. It says, see also atone, atonement, confess, confession, remission of sins, repent, repentance. As used in the scriptures, to forgive generally means one of two things. When God forgives men, he cancels or sets aside a required punishment for sin. Through the atonement of Christ, forgiveness of sins is available to all who repent, except those guilty of murder or the unpardonable sin against the Holy Ghost. Number two, as people forgive each other, they treat one another with Christ-like love and have no bad feelings toward those who have offended them. Matthew 18, 21 and 22, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Elder Brisa McConkie explained the meaning of Peter's question about forgiving others and the Savior's response. Rabbinism is call, uh, called upon the offender to initiate a course of reconciliation with his brother and, and specified that forgiveness should not be extended more than three times to any offender. His soul, as yet not afire with the Holy Spirit, Peter asked a question that, as he must have then supposed, assumed a far more liberal rule than that imposed by the rabbis. Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus answered, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven, meaning there is no limit to the number of times men should forgive their brethren. What did the Savior mean when he told Peter to forgive others until seventy times seven? Elder Lynn G. Robbins, formerly of the Presidency of the Seventy, explained the Savior essentially told Peter, Do not count. Do not establish limits on forgiveness. Obviously, the Savior was not establishing an upper limit of 490. That would be analogous to saying that partaking of the sacrament has a limit of 490, and then on the 491st time, a heavenly auditor intercedes and says, I'm so sorry, but your repentance card just expired. From this point forward, you're on your own. The Lord used the math of 70 times 7 as a metaphor of his infinite atonement, his boundless love, and his limitless grace. Yea, and as often as my people repent, will I forgive them of their trespasses against me. During World War II, a woman named Corrie ten Boom suffered for months in a Nazi concentration camp in Ravensbrück, Germany. Her sister Betsy died there. Following the war, Corrie spoke to a group of people about the forgiveness of God. Bishop Keith B. McMullen, formerly of the presiding bishopric, described what happened after her speech. As you read, think of ways Corey might have chosen to react. <clears throat> A man approached her. She recognized him as one of the cruelest guards in the camp. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he said. I was a guard there, but since that time I have become a Christian. He explained that he had sought God's forgiveness for the cruel things he had done. He extended his hand and asked, Will you forgive me? Reflect on your feelings about forgiveness. Is there anyone you have had difficulty forgiving? Sometimes it can be difficult to extend forgiveness to others, but with the Savior's help, all things are possible. As you watch the conclusion of Bishop McMullen's story about Corey facing her former prison guard, Look for how the Savior gave her the strength to forgive. Corey Ten Boom then said, It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. The message that God forgives has a condition that we forgive those who have injured us. 
I prayed silently, Help me. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. Woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. As I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried, with all my heart. For a long moment we grasped each other's hand, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love as intensely as I did then. Write down how your life would be blessed if you were able to forgive those who have offended you. <clears throat> Consider also recording how your life would be different if you did not try to forgive others. How does the Lord's willingness to forgive us strengthen your ability to forgive others? Parable of Unmerciful Stu Servant in Galilee. Peter's suggestion that we could forgive someone seven times might seem very generous, but Jesus taught a higher law. His response, I say not unto thee until seven times, but unto until seventy times seven, was teaching not about numbers, but rather about developing a Christ-like attitude of forgiveness. As you read the parable of the unmerciful servant, ponder the times when you have felt God's mercy and compassion. Is there someone who needs to feel mercy and compassion from you? Elder David A. Sorensen, David E. Sorensen, gave this important caution. Although we must forgive a neighbor who injures us, we should still work constructively to prevent that injury from being repeated. Forgiveness does not require us to accept or tolerate evil. But as we fight against sin, we must not allow hatred or anger to control our thoughts or actions. Following Peter's question about how often we, he should forgive others, the Savior taught his disciples further about the need to forgive by giving the parable of the unmerciful servant. In this parable, the king represents the Lord. The first servant represents each of us who stand in debt to the Lord, and the second servant represents anyone who may have offended us. Matthew eighteen twenty three through 35 Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, who would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him who owed him ten thousand talents. The parable refers to ten thousand talents. During the first century AD, it is estimated that 10,000 talents equaled 100 million denarii. One denarius was a typical day's wage for a common laborer. If that laborer worked 300 days a year, it would take about 33 years for him to be able to purchase one talent. And it would take over 300,000 years to earn 10,000 talents. The sum of the servant's debt. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. And the servant besought him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. The parable refers to an hundred pence. The one hundred pence owed by the servant, the fellow servant, is about one million times less than the debt owed by the first servant. And his fellow servant fell down 
at his feet and besought him saying have patience with me and i will pay thee all and he would not but he but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt so when his fellow servants saw what was done they were very sorry and came and told unto their lord all that was done then this lord after he th after that he had called him said unto him o thou wicked servant i forgave thee all that all that debt because thou desirest me shouldn't shouldest thou shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant even as i had pity on thee one of the messages of the parable of the unmerciful servant is that we must forgive others if we are to receive forgiveness from the lord president gordon b hinckley also taught this principle pleading with each of us to be more forgiving toward those who sin against us the great atonement with the supreme act of forgiveness was the supreme act of forgiveness the magnitude of that atonement is beyond our ability to comprehend completely understand i know only that it happened and that it was for me and for you the suffering was so great the agony so intense that none of us can comprehend it when the Savior offered himself as a ransom for the sins of all mankind. It is through him that we gain forgiveness. It is through him that, that there comes the certain promise that all mankind will be granted the blessings of salvation with resurrection from the dead. May God help us to be a little kinder, showing forth greater forbearance, to be more forgiving, more willing to walk the second mile to reach down and lift up those who may have sinned but have brought forth the fruits of repentance, to lay aside old grudges and nurture them no more. While serving as a member of the Presidency of the Seventy, Elder David E. Sorensen taught that when we forgive others, we let go of the past and move with faith and love into the future. When someone has hurt us or those we care about, that pain can almost be overwhelming. It can feel as if the pain or the injustice is the most important thing in the world and that we have no choice but to seek vengeance. But Christ, the Prince of Peace, teaches us a better way. It can be very difficult to forgive someone the harm they've done us, but when we do, we open ourselves up to a better future. No longer does someone else's wrongdoing control our course. When we forgive others, it frees us to choose how we will live our own lives. Forgiveness means that problems of the past no longer dictate our destinies, and we can focus on the future with God's love in our hearts. And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father, shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. If ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles recalled a time when, as a student in an institute class, he learned the value of the money mentioned in the parable of the unmerciful servant and came to understand some of the eternal truths taught in the parable. The teacher noted that the 100 pence forgiveness which we were all expected to give one another and acknowledged as a pretty fair amount of money was now precisely li was now precisely little to ask in light of the ten thousand talent forgiveness christ had extended to us that later debt our debt was an astronomical number the teacher reminded us almost incapable of comprehension but that he said was exactly the savior's point in this teaching an essential part of the parable Jesus had intended that his hearers listen, that his hearers sense just a little of the eternal scope and profound gift of his mercy, his forgiveness, his atonement. For the first time in my life, I remember feeling something of the magnitude of Christ's sacrifice for me, a gift bordering, bordering on the, on, bordering to this day in incomprehensibility, but a gift that made me, for the first time seriously consider my need to forgive other people and to be unfailingly generous generous regarding their feelings and their needs and their circumstances
Lord. How oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? I say not unto thee until seven times. But until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. And the servant therefore fell down, and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet, and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison that he should pay the debt. So, when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldst not thou have also had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do unto you. If ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother that trespasses. Father Jeffrey R. Holland said, This isn't a story about two servants arguing in the New Testament. It is a story about us, the fallen human family, mortal debtors, transgressors, and prisoners all. Every one of us is a debtor, and the verdict was imprisonment for every one of us. And there we would all have remained were it not for the grace of the King, who sets us free because he loves us and is moved with compassion toward us. Jesus uses an unfathomable measurement here because his atonement is an unfathomable gift given at an incomprehensible cost. That, it seems to me, is at least part of the meaning behind Jesus' charge to be perfect. We may not be able to demonstrate yet the 10,000 talent perfection the Father and the Son have achieved, but it is not too much for them to ask us to be a little more godlike in little things, that we speak and act, love and forgive, repent and improve, at least at the 100 pence level of perfection, which is clearly within our ability to do.
Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. Peter, son of Zebedon, <clears throat> of thee is owed one hundred pence. Andrew, son of Mark. Old one tell. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. I have not with which to pay. Then he shall be sold. his wife and children and all that he hath and payment shall be made Lord have patience with me and I will pay thee all it is impossible in a thousand lifetimes he could never repay this debt Zacchaeus. All is forgiven. <laughs> Let me see him. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. Philip! Pay me that thou owest! My lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Take him away. No! No! Have pity on me! Have pity on me! So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Zacchaeus is here. The ten thousand talents are ready, my lord. Quickly, quickly. Good. O oh, thou wicked! Forgave thee all that debt. Because thou desirest me.
Shouldst not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant? Even as I had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if he from your hearts forgive not every one of his brother their trespasses. What does this parable teach us about Jesus Christ? What does it teach us about how to treat others? One truth we can learn from this parable is that we can follow the example of Jesus Christ by forgiving others as he forgives us. The Lord reiterated the importance of forgiving others in our dispensation. Read Doctrine and Covenants 64, 9-11, looking for the Lord's teachings about forgiveness. Wherefore I say unto you, that ye ought to forgive one another, for he that forgiveth not his brother his trespasses, standeth condemned before the Lord, for there remaineth in him the greater sin. I the Lord will forgive whom I will forgive, forgive, but of you it is required to forgive all men, and ye ought to say in your hearts that God judge between me and thee, and reward thee according to thy deeds. The church leaders and elders who had received the Lord's forgiveness were instructed to extend personal forgiveness to others. The Lord explained that during his mortal ministry, his disciples sought occasion against one another and forgave not one another in their hearts. An outward demonstration of forgiveness is not sufficient. The Lord requires the heart of the children of men. President Dieter F. Uchtdorf of the First Presidency explained why extending forgiveness, why extending forgiveness is crucial for our spiritual growth. Extending forgiveness is a precondition to receiving forgiveness. For our own good, we need the moral courage to forgive and to ask for forgiveness. Never is the soul nobler and more courageous than when we forgive. This includes forgiving ourselves. Each of us is under a divinely spoken obligation to reach out with pardon and mercy and for, to forgive one another. There's a great need for this Christ-like attribute in our families, in our marriages, in our wards and stakes, in our communities, and in our nations. We will receive the joy of forgiveness in our own lives when we are willing to extend that joy freely to others. Lip service is not enough. We need to purge our hearts and minds of feelings and thoughts of bitterness and let the light and the love of Christ enter in. As a result, the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord will fill our souls with the joy accompanying divine peace of conscience. Let's sing a song about forgiveness. <laughs> 